Hi, what's the address? It's 12150 Research Parkway. And tell me what happened. Oh, my God. I was driving into work, parking my vehicle, and this gentleman, okay. he's lying on the ground next to her. Okay. Oh, my God. Where, 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 where are they? Are they in the parking lot? They're in the parking lot. Is there, can we tell if they're breathing or... Oh my God. I don't know, man. I can't go closer. Yes. Okay, can you help me Calm down, okay? And so you're on your way, right? Yeah, ma'am, I need to stay on the phone, okay? Stay okay. on the phone. Okay. Okay. I need Let all of what I am about to say be a warning to everyone who hears this. Hold your loved ones close. <laughs> Keep them safe. Do whatever you have to do. Just don't let them get hurt. There's a whole terrible world out there full of sickos, stalkers, and violators, and most of them are hiding in plain sight. But for as long as the people you love are safe and sound and by your side, the world isn't so bad. It's only when that all gets taken away from you that the world becomes a dark, cold, and lonely place of constant suffering and endless despair. All of it started when she started working at Hooters. We were just dating at the time, but we'd been into each other for a while. I didn't really like hearing that she started working somewhere so exploitative, but it was her decision and it wasn't like I didn't trust her. I was just too concerned for her safety. It turns out that my worries were well founded. I'd give anything just to go back and find some way to keep her out of that horrible job. But at the time when it really mattered, I didn't do anything. It didn't take long before I started to hear about the regulars at Hooters. To tell the truth, it always made my blood boil to hear about it. Those neck-bearded creeps who come in almost daily and chat with the waitresses and pretend their little crushes are going to get them anywhere. Liz, on the other hand, didn't seem to mind at first. I'll have a sloppy feast between them cheeks. <laughs> I started hearing a lot about one regular in particular, this old guy named Roger, who quickly turned from a little excessive to a serious problem. Liz said he used to be so charming that they actually had some kind of minor friendship going on. But of course, Roger took that out of hand. He asked her for her phone number almost every day, but she never gave it to him. Instead, she gave him an old email address that she never used just to appease him. At some point, Liz said she agreed to give him her work schedule, because he preferred to be served by her over anyone else. Whoa, don't you think that's a little private to be giving away? He's gonna come in every day anyway. If he wanted to know, he could just figure it out. Why not save him the trouble? Yeah, but that's... it's just... Don't you see why it's weird for him to want to know that in the first place? I guess working at Hooters makes you get used to a lot, because that seemed to be the first moment in which she really caught a strange feeling from this guy. Unfortunately, by then, it was probably far too late. You know the old saying about throwing a dog a bone. Things only escalated from there. Roger would hover around her and follow her to her car, and even try to ride home with her. Then. He started getting handsy, trying to reach for Liz's waist while they were talking, and getting very aggressive when she didn't allow him to put his hands on her. That, of course, is very much against the rules of Hooters, so Liz threatened to throw him out of the restaurant over it. I can still hear the conversation in my head, the way she relayed it back to me. I'm more of a loyal customer than you'll ever get! Do you know how much I tip every day? I shouldn't be treated like this! This isn't a brothel, Roger. Just because you tip a lot doesn't mean you get to treat me like a piece of meat. After that, Liz put in a word with her managers at Hooters, trying to get them to ban Roger from the establishment altogether. But they didn't listen to her, of course. They reprimanded Roger about the rules, but they were worried that if they started banning regulars, they'd lose their whole customer base just goes to show what Hooters really cares about. That's around the time that Liz remembered the email address she'd given to Roger. 
When she opened up the inbox, it was filled to the brim with hundreds of manic messages, calling her horrible names and accusing her of being a liar, and this and that and all sorts of deranged stuff to say about a sweet girl like Liz. When Roger kept showing up at her work and harassing her every day, she went to the police and showed them all the emails but they just shuffled her over to the information desk where she filed a report that would probably collect dust without ever being looked at once. When the police ignored her too, that's when she finally quit Hooters. We thought we were done with all the Roger drama right then and there. Our lives were starting to take off together. Liz started a new job as a teacher, something she'd always wanted to do. I even proposed to her as we were getting out of college and it felt like the right time to start sealing the deal. For a few months, things were pretty idyllic. Life was shaping up to be pretty nice, but then Roger showed up once more. Somehow, beyond anyone's ability to guess, Roger found out where Liz was working and started harassing her there too. The emails continued, of course, and they only got worse. Roger started sending threats and ultimatums, demanding to have her. With Roger showing up to the school she worked at, she didn't want to put any of the kids in danger by having him hanging around, and I was ready to get as far away from him as possible. So that's how we decided to move across the state to Orlando. It wasn't the greatest thing to have to do, but it helped us feel safer. We both got jobs at the same place, which was nice, except for the fact that it was a customer service call center, which was pretty soul-sucking. For some time, we managed. Roger continued to send his emails, but we thought he'd lost track of us and wouldn't be a problem anymore. When we moved into our new house, we got married. We were able to go on our honeymoon undisturbed and live our lives like normal people, for a few months at least. But again, somehow, Roger found us. But this time, he showed up at our house. I'm ready for my meal. Get the hell out of here or I'm calling the cops! Liz found a letter in our backyard with no postage on it, which meant that it had been delivered by Roger himself. Liz didn't let me read what was in the letter, but it must have shaken her. She called the police and had an emergency court date set up for the next day. We compiled all the evidence we had against Roger. All the emails, the workplace harassment, all the interactions Liz had with him, and how he followed us from town to town relentlessly. Somehow, behind all semblance of logic, the judge thought that was all insufficient evidence to instate a restraining order. Rather than put a restraining order against Roger so that we could finally have some safety in our lives, the judge scheduled a hearing with Roger in the following weeks, which meant the judge notified our stalker that we attempted to get a restraining order filed against him. Liz (gasps) and I were both paralyzed with fear when we realized this. We had no idea what Roger would do when he found out about this, but we knew it wouldn't be good. We tried our best to wait it out patiently, but we didn't get the chance. The last time I saw Liz, we were sitting in our car in the parking lot of our place of work. Her shift started an hour before mine, so she got out of the car and went in first. But within a matter of seconds, she called me, distraught. He's here! He's here! Roger's here! Come get me quickly, please! I jumped out of the car and ran for the entrance to the call center, but... I couldn't get there in time. I heard the gunshots and I knew. There were so many gunshots. It was like each one shattered my soul and then crushed the remaining shards into dust. When I got there, Liz was on the ground in a pool of blood, full of bullet holes. Roger was there too, but I didn't pay any attention to him. His brains were splattered across the pavement, but I had no time to rejoice. The love of my life was dying right before my eyes. Somebody call 911! Oh, baby, I'm so sorry. I love you so much. You're gonna be okay. You're gonna be okay. I love you. We rushed Liz to the hospital, but it was too late. Uh, what happened is a little bit over a year ago, she was a, she worked at a Hooters restaurant near the beach. 
Roger Troy, a 16-year-old man, 61? 61 years old, and he and, and she he was only 23. Is chasing this 23-year-old girl. It seems like that he became obsessed with her. He would uh, write her harassing emails, follow her around, even stop by her house. She uh, filed for a restraining order with a judge. Sir, you are the What is the address of the emergency? Help us. Help us. Hello? 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 She's still alive. Oh, no. Hello? Oh, this is why I love you. I love you. Sir, help her. Help her. Help her. Give her CPR. Okay. Put your phone down. Put your phone down. Keep pushing, keep pushing. Sir? Oh my god! Sir? Okay, stay close. Keep pushing. Come on, baby! Yes, I'm staying close. Where's the ambulance? 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 Before we get to our horror stories, we would like to give a big thank you to Boxu for sponsoring this video. Usually on our channel we focus on scary and grotesque topics. However, today we wanted to highlight some delicious and exclusive snacks straight from Japan. Boxu is a premium Japanese snack box subscription service that delivers original assortments of Japanese snacks and tea pairings right to your door. Use my code HORROR10 or click our link in the description box to get 10% off your own authentic Japanese subscription from Boxu. Don't miss out on this amazing snack journey through Japan. Each month has a different theme so you can experience a different side of Japan every time. Let's take a look at our box for this month. Oh, we got a Sakura season box, which highlights the unique flavors you would find during cherry blossom season in Japan. I must say, they pack a lot of snacks in here. Here we have a Sakura sweet cookie. This is a tea biscuit with delicious Sakura flavor, and the packaging is so pretty. Not to mention how delicious it is. The Boxu Culture Guide tells us that this is a snack from the Shizuoka region of Japan. Okay, let's try this. This is a premium peach gummy from Japan's largest peach producer, and it's bursting with flavor. Let's try a couple more. Here we have a Sakura Mochi, which is a traditional Japanese rice cake. This was probably my favorite snack so far. And lastly, we have these strawberry milk marshmallows that are made with Polish freeze-dried strawberries. You guys are probably salivating as I eat this in front of you, so you should go and get a subscription yourself. Use my code HORROR10 or click the link in the description box to get 10% off your own authentic Japanese subscription from Boxu. Don't miss out on this amazing snack journey through Japan, horror shorties. I used to go to Hooters all the time. I really was one of those guys who hung around there every weekend, pining for attention from all the pretty girls and hoping to score a date with one. But I should warn you, from my experience, there could be a cost to that habit which you won't see on your tab. Some of those girls are after more than just tips. But don't take that the wrong way. I certainly did. And all the time I wasted in there, I got to know nearly all the girls by name. I'd always strike up conversation as I ordered the same beer and wings every time. So often to the point that the waitress has started to know my order before I even said a word. There was this one girl I was super interested in. Her name was Stephanie. I made sure to see every angle of every girl that worked there, and Stephanie was the hottest by far, and she was the most popular without a doubt. The way she worked creeps like me for tips. I'm just a sucker for it. I tried really hard to get in close with her. I guess looking back on it now, people would call it simping, but it turned out to be more than just a cringy mistake for me. One night, I'd called up a friend and asked him to go to the bar with me. Of course, we ended up at Hooters. This friend of mine was not so different from me. We backed each other up in conversation, and after we'd spent a few hours in there, things seemed to be going our way. It was approaching closing time, 
so the girls had enough spare time to linger with us a little longer than usual. I was chatting up Stephanie, and my friend was capturing the attention of another fine Hooters girl. The only problem was, and I'm a little ashamed to admit I caught this, but I knew that Stephanie and this other girl kind of hated each other. There were a lot of times I'd hear them get into fights and get really nasty, so I was surprised to see the two of them together. Still, Stephanie shot that other girl some dirty looks that night. Despite all that, I tried to make the best of it, but then, Stephanie dropped a bit of a bombshell. Yeah, so I know you've been waiting for the right moment to ask me on a date or whatever, but I'm just letting you know that this is my last shift, so don't miss your chance, Jack. Wait, what? You're leaving? For what? I'm going to college, dummy. Where do you think all your money's been going? Oh, well, I guess you gotta move on. But I'll take you up on that last chance for a date. When are you free? I'm free as soon as I clock out, babe. And you can bring that cute friend of yours, too. As she finished speaking... She twirled around and walked away from us. My friend and I dropped our jaws in disbelief, but we chose to believe. This was the best thing that had happened to us in a long time. We closed our tabs and made sure to tip even more handsomely than usual. Then we waited impatiently for our dates to get off work. Finally, we all joined up and left the restaurant, then piled into my car. I remember my head being a mess right about then. With the beers in my system and the girls in my car, I was distracted. The first mistake I made was driving home from Hooters on autopilot, because I had this weird route through some back roads that I wouldn't have taken if I'd been thinking about not creeping out the passengers I had. As soon as I made the turn off the main road onto that dark narrow stretch into the woods, the car fell silent, and things got tense. (laughs) Sorry about the deserted road, everyone. This is the way I usually take to get around all the traffic. Oh, don't worry, Jack. You're doing just fine. I was a little confused as to what Stephanie meant by that, but before I could even ask, something else came up. I saw a flash of bright headlights in my rearview mirror, quickly growing as some van was accelerating towards us. Around the same moment, I could hear the distant roar of several motorcycles, which I never heard on this road. I kept looking into my mirror thinking the van would slow down to avoid rear-ending us, but they didn't. They slammed into the car and sent us flying forward. I hit the brakes trying to regain control of the car. The van just kept crashing into us from behind until they'd run us off the road. I finally got the car to stop when I saw the motorcycles catch up and surround us before the riders dismounted. Suddenly, there were half a dozen thugs in all black brandishing bats and knives and guns all standing around my car in a circle. Then they made their move. Get the hell out of the car! Now! Move it! I saw Stephanie jump out from the shotgun seat, so I followed suit, abandoning my car with the key still in the ignition. I lost sight of Stephanie immediately. Then I was struck to the ground by someone I didn't even see. A boot pressed against my back and pinned me to the ground. The shouting of orders didn't stop. Actually, they got louder. Out! Now! Come on, you two! Don't be stupid! Get out of the car! Out of the car! We're warning you! Get out now! I turned as far as I could to see, and my friend and the girl he picked up were still in the backseat of the car. They were trembling in fear, just frozen for some reason. No matter how many times they were told to get out, they just didn't. One of the thugs smashed the window. (coughs) Another window was shattered, then another. And at the same time I could hear all that, I also heard glugging and splashing, like somebody was pouring water all over the ground. For a second, nothing happened. I thought they were getting out, but then I heard glass breaking again. And this time it wasn't a window. It must have been a bottle. A huge fire erupted from the car. It lit up the scene in an orange light, and I could feel the heat of the fire on my face even as I was pressed against the ground. Then I heard them screaming, burning alive in my car. It took so long for it to stop. When that was finally over, I got yanked to my feet. Give us what you got, punk. Come on, strip. Clothes, money, phone. Everything you own is ours. Come on, don't be stupid now. I did as they commanded, stripping to just my underwear and giving them everything I had. I was still in shock. I couldn't even think about my friend yet. The reality of it was too horrible. I thought about Stephanie. I was worried what they might do to her, but I couldn't see her in the darkness. 
Not until all the thugs finally let me be and climbed back into their van and got back on their motorcycles and sped off into the night. The last motorcyclist waited for Stephanie to climb onto his back before disappearing. She looked back at me and winked as I could feel my blood boil. She had this planned all along. No wonder she said today was her last shift. And that, my friends, is the real cost of creeping at Hooters. Your belongings, your friends, maybe your life. I've been a cook at Hooters for several years now, and while I can say from a cook's perspective that it isn't far removed from any other restaurant, it's obviously a very different story for the waitresses. In all the time I've worked there, I've never seen any waitress stay for more than a year, and even that long is a rarity. Our turnover rate has always been extremely high, and I don't expect it to go down anytime soon. It's certainly no secret why so many girls leave shortly after getting hired. They have to put up with a lot out there, and the new girls get it the worst. It's like the creeps get off on singling them out. Given all of that, I try to make the kitchen a safe haven for the waitresses, somewhere they can get away from the prying eyes and unwanted advances. I do my best to crack wholesome jokes and strike up conversation that hopefully reminds them that not all of humanity is represented by the scum that comes to Hooters on a regular basis, and the whole time I keep my eyes on the grill. It never seemed to be enough though. Whenever I'd start getting to know somebody, they'd suddenly quit without notice. It started to hurt my feelings, to be honest. Don't get me wrong, I've never had to go through what they had to go through, but it always felt just a little rude to leave us short-staffed without warning. Especially since it wasn't that they would just quit, it was like they skipped town entirely, ghosting everyone so that nobody at the restaurant could even get a hold of them. At least, that's what I'd hoped was happening. However, in the last year or so, something entirely more disturbing started happening. The rate of people quitting got worse, seemingly out of nowhere. I had my suspicions, but I didn't want to believe it. But once the police started coming to the restaurant with a barrage of questions, I had to face it. Those girls were really disappearing. Nobody had heard from them, and the last place each of them was seen was the Hooters. Somehow, the suspicion fell on me. The girls around here say you're very friendly with the staff. What's a man of your looks doing expressing interest in girls like these? It's nothing like that, sir. I'm just trying to be a nice guy, you know? Oh, so you're a nice guy, huh? Uh, no, 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 I, I didn't mean it like that. I'm just... <sighs> All right, you're going to have to come into the station with us. That's right. They arrested me. They had me profiled as some sort of incel extremist. They held me at the station for a full 24 hours, berating me with the same questions over and over again. I had no idea where those girls were, but they just wouldn't take I don't know for an answer. I had no interest in those girls, even if I were a serial killer, which I'm not. But anyway, after all that mess with the police, they finally let me go. I had to go somewhere to clear my head. The last thing I wanted to do was stress eat, so I decided to go hiking. It used to be an old hobby of mine, before I went and got fat in my middle age. There's an old biking trail in town that lots of hikers and joggers go along to get away from the concrete and car fumes of the suburban roads. It's a really nice wooded area, very peaceful scenery. But if I wasn't a big guy, I wouldn't walk it alone. The trail was a lot longer than I remembered. In an effort to make the going a little easier on myself, I subconsciously followed all the forks that went downhill. I scorned the thought of going uphill but part of me knew I'd have to do it at some point. Eventually, I found myself at the bottom of some sort of basin, surrounded on all sides by hills. The trail had flared out into an unkempt clearing, with a bunch of tall, thin trees being just about the only foliage that survived. Nothing about it seemed unusual at first, but small pieces of white caught my eye. 
At first, I thought it was some sort of fungus or moss growing in the bark of the trees, but as I rubbed my eyes clear of the sweat that had poured into them, I saw what they really were. They were pieces of paper which had been taped onto the trees, and they were everywhere. Dozens of them, all over the clearing. I traipsed through the leaves to get a closer look at one of them. Then, my heart sank. It was a missing persons poster, and I recognized the face. It was one of my old co-workers from ages ago. Her name was Sally, and she hadn't been seen in years. I tore my eyes away and found another slip of paper just a few feet away on a different tree, and on it, another call for help from a grieving family looking for their lost daughter, again, my old co-worker, and this one from a more recent time, Judy from last year, Sarah from six months ago, Alice from last fall, and Tracy from just two weeks ago. There must have been a dozen of missing girls posted in that clearing. I couldn't handle it all coming down at once. For so long, I thought all of these girls had just no called, no showed. I'd even had the audacity to feel offended. And all this time, they were missing. Every single girl I've ever worked with was probably there. No wonder the police were suspicious of me. It was like someone was doing all of this to get at me. I fell to my knees and <laughs> sobbed for several minutes. Eventually, I dried up and got to my feet. And when my crying quieted, I began to hear something else, digging. It came from some kind of large yellow tent at the edge of the clearing, where some shrubs were still attempting to overtake it. Quietly, I inched closer to it until I was right outside. The sound of digging from within was as loud as it could be. I stepped forward and reached for the curtain, pulling it back and revealing <gasps> my worst nightmare. There, in the damp yellow darkness of the tent, some crazed and half-naked lunatic was digging into the knotted ground. But it wasn't dirt he was digging through. It was bodies. The bodies of a dozen missing Hooter girls in various stages of decomposition, all thrown haphazardly into the same disgusting hole. And right by my feet, the fresh corpse of the last girl who had quit Hooters, with her lifeless eyes staring right up at me. I didn't even get the chance to learn her name. What are you gonna do about it, Fry Cook? My throat closed up. I couldn't speak. I just backed away very slowly and closed the curtain behind me. Then I ran faster and farther than I had run in over a decade until I was finally out of the woods. I'm still traumatized from that incident. And honestly, who wouldn't be?